pistols and coins soon settled at the, to the bottom, but the pipes, pipe stems, tobacco, and canteens clattered and floundered after the dictionary every time it made an assault on us, and aided and abetted the book by spilling tobacco in our eyes and water down our backs. Still, all things considered, it was a very comfortable night. It wore gradually away, and when at last a cold gray light was visible through the puckers and chinks in the curtains, we yawned and stretched with satisfaction, shed our cocoons, and felt that we had slept as much as was necessary. By and by, as the sun rose up and warmed the world, we pulled off our clothes and got ready for breakfast. We were just pleasantly in time, for five minutes afterward the driver sent the weird music of his bugle winding over the grassy solitudes, and presently we detected a low hut or two in the distance, then the rattling of the coach, the clatter of our six horses' hooves, and the driver's crisp commands awoke to a louder and stronger emphasis, and we went sweeping down on the station at our smartest speed. It was fascinating, that old overland stage coaching. We jumped out in undress uniform. The driver tossed his gathered reins out on the ground, gaped and stretched complacently, drew off his heavy buckskin gloves with great deliberation and insufferable dignity. Taking not the slightest notice of a dozen solicitous inquiries, inquiries after his health, and humbly facetious and flattering accostings and obsequious tenders of service for five, from five or six hairy and half-civilized station keepers and hostlers who were nimbly unhitching our steeds and bringing the fresh team out of the stables. From the eyes of the stage driver of that day, station keepers and hostlers were a sort of good enough low creatures useful in their place in helping to make up a world, but not the kind of beings which a person of distinction could afford to concern himself with. While on the contrary, in the eyes of the station keeper and the hostler, the stage driver was a hero, the great and shining dignitary, the world's favorite son, the envy of the people, the observed of the nations. When they spoke to him, they received his insolent silence meekly, and as being the natural and proper conduct of so great a man. When he opened his lips, they all hung on his words with admiration. He never honored a particular individual with a remark, but addressed it with a broad generality to the horses, the stables, the surrounding country, and the human underlings. When he discharged a facetious, insulting personality at a hostler, that hostler was happy for the day, when he uttered his one jest, old as the hills, coarse, profane, witless, and inflicted on the same audience in the same language every time his coach drove up there, the varlets roared and slapped their thighs and swore it was the best thing they'd ever heard in all their lives. And how they would fly around when he wanted a basin of water, a gourd of the same, or a light for his pipe. But they would instantly insult a passenger if he so far forgot himself as to crave a favor at their hands. They could do that sort of insolence as well as the driver they copied it from. For let it be borne in mind, the overland driver had but little less contempt for his passengers than he had for his hostlers. The hostlers and station keepers treated the really powerful conductor of the coach merely with the, be the best of what was their idea of civility but the driver was the only being they bowed down to and worshipped. How admiringly they would gaze up at him in his high seat as he gloved himself with lingering deliberation, while some happy hostler held the bunch of reins aloft and waited patiently for him to take it. And how they would bombard him with glorifying ejaculations as he cracked his long whip and went careering away. The station buildings were long, low huts made of sun-dried, mud-colored bricks, laid up without mortar, adobes, the Spaniards call these bricks, and Americans shorten it to dobies. The roofs, which had no slant to them worth speaking of, were thatched and then sodded or covered with a thick layer of earth, and from this sprung a pretty rank growth of weeds and grass. It was the first time we had ever seen a man's front yard on top of his house. 
The buildings consisted of barns, stable room for 12 or 15 horses, and a hut for an eating room for passengers. This ladder had bunks in it for the station keeper and a hostler or two. You could rest your elbow on its eaves and you had to bend in order to get in at the door. In place of a window there was a square hole about large enough for a man to crawl through, but this had no glass in it. There was no flooring, but the ground was packed hard. There was no stove, but the fireplace served all needful purposes. There were no shelves, no cupboards, no closets. In a corner stood an open sack of flour, and nestling against its base were a couple of black and venerable tin coffee pots, a tin teapot, a little bag of salt, and a side of bacon. By the door of the station keeper's den, outside was a t tin wash basin on the ground. Near it was a pail of water and a piece of yellow bar soap, and from the eaves hung a hoary blue woolen shirt. Significantly, but this latter was the station keeper's private towel, and only two persons in all the party might venture to use it, the stage driver and the conductor. The latter would not, from a sense of decency, the former would not, because he did not choose to encourage the advances of a station keeper. We had towels in the valise. They might as well have been in Sodom and Gomorrah. We and the conductor used our handkerchiefs and the driver his pantaloons and sleeves. By the door inside was fastened a small old-fashioned looking glass frame with two little f fragments of the original mirror lodged down in one corner of it. This arrangement afforded a pleasant double-barreled portrait of you when you looked into it with one half of your head set up a couple of inches above the other half. <coughs> From the glass frame hung the half of a comb by a string. But if I had to describe the patriarch or die, I believe I would order some simple co some sample coffins. It had come down from, from Esau and Samson and had been accumulating hair ever since, along with certain impurities. In one corner of the room stood three or four rifles and muskets, together with horns and pouches of ammunition. I know. Dollars in earthquake relief funds. The money will go to seven Northern California counties and to case management, program implementation, and monitoring, as well as quake preparedness. A spokesman for the relief agency says a special committee set up by the Red Cross tried to distribute...